Welcome to On the Middle East, our monitor's podcast on the big and interesting stories of the day. My name is Amrin Zaman, and today I'll be focusing on the current standoff between Israel and Iran. Fears of an all-out war between the two regional enemies are growing as Israel vows to respond to Iran's unprecedented weekend attack on its soil. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced today that Israel would make its own decision as to how it would proceed amid calls from its Western allies for restraint. Iran's President Ibrahim Raisi warned today that even the slightest Israeli intervention on Iranian soil would bring what he called a massive and harsh response. Joining us from Tehran to discuss the latest developments is Hassan Ahmadian, an assistant professor of West Asian and North African studies at the University of Tehran and a senior research fellow at the Middle East Scientific and Strategic Studies Center, also in Tehran. Hassan did postdoctoral research at Harvard's Belfort Center, and his work focuses mainly on Iranian foreign policy. So welcome to our program, Hassan. It's great to have you with us here today. Thanks for having me. So I'm just going to kick off by asking you, what's the mood like over there in Tehran? Are people nervous? Are they sort of hiding in their homes, awaiting some big Israeli attack? Or is life kind of going on as usual? So the general mood here is basically that Iran retaliated and uh, uh, that's it. The Israelis and the United States also don't want uh, a war, a direct war. And so the Iranians uh, have uh, uh, achieved what they were after, that is deterrence. Now, when you go to the public, of course, there's another story. There are all sorts of theories on where things are going and uh, how things might unfold. You could hear it in, in the Iranian media as well. Uh, uh, some are really worried that this can escalate, uh, though this has gone uh, down after the Israelis waited at least three days now uh, to respond to the Iranian uh, uh, retaliation. Uh, and also, uh, there are others who have been quite confident, I should say, that, well, uh, retaliation actually strengthened Iran's deterrence. So we are not to see much provocation on the part of the Israelis or the Americans. And in between, you can hear lots of other voices. But of course, there's no consensus here. Well, I mean, when Iran attacked Israel, I mean, what kind of a re response was it actually banking on? There's a lot of speculation that this was very uh, carefully uh, calibrated and lots of discussions took place with the Americans indirectly through third parties on, you know, how to avoid an escalation while saving face for Iran. Um, what actually do you think Iran was expecting after attacking Israel directly for the first time? Does it, do you think it feels like it's achieved deterrence or was this a huge gamble? It was actually a humiliation to Iran to see its consulate in Damascus hit by Israel and not to do anything about it. So the Iranians uh, tried to avoid escalation, but they had to do something about it to uh, talk to their uh, internal audience, but also to strengthen their deterrence that uh, seemed to be at uh, risk in the region vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the United States more broadly. So they went to the Security Council first, demanding a response to the Israeli attack on the Iranian consulate. When that was vetoed by France and the United States, they, uh, I mean, reportedly offered uh, a ceasefire in Gaza for them not to retaliate. That was a turn down as well. And then they went for the third option, which was very calibrated uh, response, direct response, which was unprecedented against Israel. Uh, now that was supposed to deter Israel from further escalation because the way uh, 
the Israeli uh, campaign was viewed from Iran is that the Israelis, uh, because of them being bogged down in Gaza, they tried, and specifically we're talking about Netanyahu and his uh, extremist you know, uh, ministers, uh, being bogged down within Gaza, they tried to divert attention by escalating directly against Iran, and they went on a campaign of incremental escalation that started with assassinations and then a house of a Iranian general uh, in Syria was attacked and this was the third level that was an attack on Iranian consulate. Many in Iran were uh, uh, fearful of uh, uh, Israel moving even closer to the Iranian mainland if it wasn't deterred and ergo there was a strategic rationale behind the retaliation. But at the same time, they didn't want this to get out of hand. So uh, they, they activated their channels with the United States saying that we are forced to retaliate. We don't want to tar target you. Don't get involved in this. The Americans were clear on that they will not be part of any attack on Iran, but they will defend Israel. And they did when they donned many missiles and, uh, and uh, uh, drones. So I think uh, it was both uh, measured and it was the last resort. It was aimed at deterrence, deterring further escalations on the part of the Israelis. And uh, what I, I mean, the feeling I get nowadays is that uh, there's a, uh, a, a sort of consensus that the Iranian, the Iranians have achieved a deterrence. And uh, if you look at the rhetoric within Israel, uh, it's it's to the, to a large extent true, I guess, because I mean the the, the talks there suggesting retaliation, not not retaliating, building diplomatic campaign against Iran, sanctioning Iran, all sorts of different you know scenarios, which are telling the Iranians that their attack was effective because the uh, options in Israel are really not quite uh, appealing. But you say deterrence. There's also a lot of mockery of the of Iran in that practically all of those missiles were taken down uh, by the Americans and the Israelis, and some say the Jordanians. So, I mean, was it really deterrence? And setting that aside, we also know that Netanyahu has a key, you know, a, a real interest in escalating because for him it's existential for as long as he can keep his country on a war footing uh, that kind of saves his own skin so did Iran possibly walk into his trap uh, however much you know the Americans are trying to sort of de-escalate and to sort of rein him in so far they well, failed in I mean he he's escalating not just in um, Gaza, but now against you. So, where where isn't this? Aren't we actually in a very unpredictable and dangerous situation? Well, it is. It is, as I said, uh, the Iranians were fearful of uh, 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 more escalation on the part of Israel if they didn't do anything about hitting the Iranian consulate, which was uh, obviously part of or under Iranian sovereignty. Uh, as per the Vienna Convention. Uh, so it was deterrence, I would argue, uh, because basically the Iranians, uh, the theatrics of it, if you look at it, uh, the Iranians announced uh, 27, in 27 hours we will attack. And then when they launched their very slow drones, uh, they said, we, we did launch them and gave uh, ample time to the other side to uh, intercept and, and down them. Uh, six hours before they reach uh, the, uh, the Israel, Israel uh, space, uh, they were announced that they, 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 they have been launched, gave, giving the Americans, others, the Israelis time to intercept them. On the other side, they used very uh, low-tech drones, the very uh, the lowest tech drones in attack in Israel, saying that, I mean, suggesting that we are not here to harm you. We are, we are telling you we can reach you, even if you down much of it after we announce it. 
the missiles that were used also were not Iran's high tech. Were, they were actually very basic Iranian ballistic missiles. So uh, 10 years ago, they entered uh, uh, the Iranian uh, uh, arsenal. Uh, ten nine years ago, so they weren't the the latest uh, uh, and the strongest missiles the Iranians could have used. They were basically signaling that we can reach you with old technology. Don't think of you know provoking us. We can do more. So the theatrics of it did what the Iranians want, to my understanding, deterring the Israelis. Uh, and right after that, the Iranian National Se Security Council announced that any attack on the part of Israel will be met with tenfold of what the latest attack uh, looked like or was. So uh, uh, deterrence is ultimately about conditional threats and credibility for those conditional threats through power projection. So they are issuing conditional threats on, in, the, in the National Security Council, which is the highest decision-making body uh, within the Iranian political system, and they have credibilized those threats, conditional threats, when they attacked Israel and announced it on air. So in terms of deterrence, I think they achieved what they wanted. When it comes to Netanyahu, personally, I don't think he's a really risk taker. He's, uh, he has shown in many occasions that he only moves in when there is less risk, more to gain. When there is a huge risk, he usually backs down. Uh, I know this is uh, this is this goes against much of the you know talks about Netanyahu himself being trying to provoke provoke and uh, score points for his personal uh, political position within Israel. But I think that's been proven in many occasions. And I think uh, with regards to Iran, he moved in against Iran in, in, uh, in uh, Syria, in the Iranian consulate, because he thought the Iranians will not go beyond what where they have already moved. That is indirect uh, attacks through proxies against Israel or an assassination here or there. Uh, he didn't expect this uh, direct uh, retaliation. I suspect that if he knew that the Iranians will do that, he wouldn't have gone for the Iranian consulate, because this put him and uh, his future also at stake, his political future also at stake, because, I mean, look at where the Israelis are now. If they retaliate, they fear a stronger Iranian retaliation. If they don't, there is, you know, uh, criticism to go around in Tel Aviv, against uh, him and his generals. Why did they do that? Why did they escalate? And that the Israeli deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Iran and its allies is weakened. And we, we have heard that in the past two, three days. You say that Iran has established deterrence, uh, but you also said it had to do that because to not respond would have been a huge loss of face for Iran. But then Israel, too, is now going to have to respond because it would be a huge loss of face for Israel if it did not respond to this first direct attack uh, on its soil by Iran. Um, how confident are you, for example, that the United States will intervene to make sure that whatever Israel does is also equally theatrical, as you put it, in order to avert further escalation? Well, we, know, we don't exactly know to what extent the United States will be willing and is willing to stop Israel and to what extent it can stop Israel. So both are, we don't exactly know. Uh, Israel has a track record of moving solo when it comes to some issues with regards to Iran or the region. So they're talking about trying to de-escalate, but their actions are not quite, uh, you know, in between trying to stop the escalation. You need to have some sort of leverage when it comes to Israel. And it seems lacking at this point. Well, uh, so it, it exists. It's just that the Americans aren't willing to use it, as we see in Israel's war against Gaza. 
uh, they could yeah as, as you say yeah they can they can use it or they they lack more I mean it's it's not clear really yeah, so that whether they goes back to the question of what I mean isn't this a gamble for Iran to be so confident that yes we've <laughs> we have achieved deterrence I mean things could get really nasty as you say well if the, America the Iranians anything. yeah yeah the Iranians were very clear on that if we're hit we're gonna hit back they didn't talk about the United States. They didn't talk about Israel. You know, when, when you're sitting in Tehran thinking about how to deal with the Israeli provocation, I mean, it was very clear indication of trying to provoke Iran when they attacked the Iranian embassy, the, the Iranian consulate. If you look at that, then you're a country that is producing pretty much what it needs in terms of defense and trying to uh, cope with its strategic environments, threats emanating from this strategic uh, environment. So it's about who uh, blinks first when it comes to Israel and Iran. When uh, we talk about the Iranians taking a gamble, I think it's true to some extent. But when you look at the Iranians and their calculus vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the United States more broadly, could see that they they feel like they're under threat, constant threat. Uh, the Israelis are escalating. The United States is not deterring them. We don't know to what extent they can deter them. Uh, but they are issuing threats against Iran that if you escalate, we will do this or that. Uh, but when, when it came to the Israeli provocation, they were like, if we don't do something, this uh, you know, incremental escalation on the part of the Israelis would continue. People spoke on the Iranian media in, inside Iran. If we don't stop them, uh, we, they, they will assassinate Iranian leaders with them. So you have to do something about it to establish some sort of line that you can't cross it. We will not cross it if you don't. And that has been the rhetoric. So it's a, you're, you're right in that it has a uh, some some uh, you know level of gambling in it, but it's a calculated gambling, if I may say. Who are your friends? Speaking of enemies, where do you think Russia stands in all of this? China, and maybe even Turkey, because we know, for example, that many of the Gulf nations are secretly cheering Israel on. You do have a lot of enemies in the region. Um, who who are your friends, and what? role do you think they can play in helping defuse this crisis? Well, the Chinese and the Russians specifically, they have been supportive diplomatically. They condemned the Israeli attack on the Iranian consulate. They, uh, they did not condemn the Iranian retaliation. Uh, I mean, the Russians were very clear, the Russian president, that uh, this was uh, very, uh, you know, they, the right of the Iranians to retaliate. Uh, the Chinese came in also in the same line, though less uh, public or less high level. Uh, and I think those are perceived in Iran as friends. But when it comes to military calculus, the Iranians feel lonely less. That's why they bank on their own internal defense programs, and they see them as essential to their national security. They need to produce what they need to defend the country with. And they have been doing that for four decades now. Uh, and based on this, their military, military calculus is also based on, uh, you know, going it solo. Though they try to keep it within the international law as they have, been, have, have kept uh, repeating time and again that our consulate was head, the Security Council didn't do anything. We had to take actions on uh, on our own. Uh, I mean, despite the, the 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 friendship that Iran enjoys with many countries, it does not expect them to support her in its uh, uh, you know uh, uh, military confrontations in its uh, 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 tit for tat vis a vis Israel or any other country. Arab countries are a different category. And we have uh, Iran being very much popular nowadays because of its confrontation with Israel. We have some regimes supporting Israel, which is a dichotomy. I think uh, non-Arab regime is uh, very much welcoming uh, 
the Iranians uh, who were perceived during the Arab Spring as very sectarian, nowadays they are perceived as heroes who are standing up to Israel, which is very appealing, by the way, to the Iranian leadership. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, uh, when, when we talk about uh, friends and enemies, there's a really different uh, uh, categories to be uh, taken into account, including, for instance, if you look at, uh, you know, Jordanian explanation of their downing of Iranian uh, drones, the foreign minister were like, we were defending our space. We don't want to be a theater for, you know, uh, Iran-Israeli confrontation. Didn't speak uh, against Iran or for Israel. So even even those who st stood with Israel, they felt the necessity to distance themselves from Israel because of that public opinion and public uh, rage with the Israelis well, and what they do. It's very difficult to gauge because these countries are not democracies, obviously, and they are terribly repressive regimes. But I agree with you that there is definitely a certain level of smugness when you hear some of these um, uh, Gulf commentators proclaiming that this uh, conflict in Gaza is not transformational and that, you know, it will eventually be forgotten and will be back to business as usual. I think that totally underestimates um, what's happening at, at the popular level and however much uh, people don't seem to have much agency uh, because of the lack of democracy. That's not to say that at some point you know, they may rise up, I don't know. But um, I guess my uh, final question is um, maybe a slightly naive one, but do you see opportunities in this crisis? For example, for reestablishing some kind of meaningful dialogue with the United States? Well, I think activating the channels with the United States on the part of Iranians is a positive development in all of this. So it was it was focused on Israel, but at the same time, uh, you know, they were indicative of how uh, tension can be diffused when there is a direct line of communication and you know messaging between the two. Uh, though two, the two parties took their messages, the, the others' messages, and public publicized them in their own way. But still, I think that was a positive sign of how things can work out when there is a crisis in the region. Another, uh, you know, aspect of this is that the Iranians, uh, you know, setting their red line and channeling them to the United States, that this is our red line. Uh, and I imagine the Israelis doing the same is also uh, some sort of red line mapping that can defuse future escalation that is uh, it seems that is not on the agenda of the United States, at least publicly, not on the Iranian side. We don't know about the Israeli because, you know, Netanyahu, not Netanyahu, Israel, Netanyahu, we don't know exactly where things uh, are moving there. Uh, so I think there, there's, a, there's a lot in that direction in Iran-US uh, side. But also when it comes to what you described as, you know, the gap between uh, the the regimes and the people. I think wherever you have a resemblance of democracy, say in Kuwait, for instance, right? There is a democratically elected parliament. You could you can't see you know any official siding with with Israel because you know the public is supportive of the Palestinian uh, cause and they want an independent Palestinian state. Well, I mean, Iran has also had its own internal problems, and uh, I have little. Of that um, Israel will seek to exploit that uh, at this time, particularly if further sanctions kick in and life becomes even more difficult for ordinary Iranians. Let's hope this all is resolved in some way soon and um, we can all uh, you know, live peacefully together. Thank you so much for joining us, Hassan. It was wonderful speaking to you today. Thank you for having me. And this brings us to the end of this week's episode of On the Middle East. Let's hope that cooler minds will prevail and that there'll be no further escalation between Israel and Iran. Thank you for tuning in and goodbye.